15 minute or less lecture series on human anatomy, chapter 18, the brain and cranial nerves, part one. Uh, the brain is surrounded by the meninges, cranial meninges, cranial because they're in the cranial cavity, and they are continuous with the spinal meninges. Therefore, from superficial to the deep, they will be dura mater, the most superficial, which actually ends up being two layers, the periosteal layer that lies against the bone of the skull and the meningeal layer. And between these two layers, in certain areas, you form what are called the dural sinuses. These dural sinuses are veins that drain blood away from the brain. So again, most superficial dura matter, followed by arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space, filled with cerebral spinal fluid, and then the pia matter lying on the brain itself. Um, there are extensions of the dura matter that end up separating regions of the brain. There is the fox cerebri, which separates the two hemispheres of the cerebrum and goes into the longitudinal fissure. There's the tentorium cerebelli. Uh, this separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum and in, goes into the transverse fissure. And then there's the fox cerebelli, which uh, goes to separate the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. Uh, it's often caused by an infection. Symptoms can include fever, headache, stiff neck, vomiting, confusion, lethargy, and drowsiness, and can sometimes be fatal. Once you get um, inflammation and infection of the meninges, this also means that there's also infection in the uh, cardiovascular system and the blood vessels. It can lead to damage to very small blood vessels that could cause amputations of limbs. Cerebral spinal fluid, as we know, is clear colorless fluid found in subarachnoid space around this area. Its important functions include mechanical protection, shock absorbing medium that helps to void the brain in place, chemical protection provides an optimal and chemical environment for the brain, and circulation it allows a minor exchange of nutrients and waste, and also is involved in the lymphatic functions. Majority of cerebral spinal fluid is made in the choroid plexuses. These are structures found within the ventricles of the brain. Here you will find the epidermal cells covering blood capillaries, pulling the cerebral spinal fluid from the blood plasma. Uh, there are four ventricles in total. There is the left and right lateral ventricles. These are one per cerebral hemisphere. They then connect up to the third ventricle, which lies between the <coughs> uh, two sides of the uh, thalamus. So it is within the midline, a little bit above the hypothalamus. And then the fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle lies between the brain stem and the cerebellum. And these are continuous with the subarachnoid space and the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, the interventricular foramina are two holes that connect the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. Then cerebral aqueduct of the cerebrum connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, and then the fourth ventricle connects via the median aperture and lateral apertures to the subarachnoid space, or continues directly to form the central canal of the spinal cord. Eventually, the cerebrospinal fluid will be reabsorbed into the bloodstream via the arachnoid villi. So here is an image of the subarachnoid space, and as you can see, it's going all the way around the brain, and then there are certain areas where the arachnoid villi are formed. This will then drain cerebral spinal fluid from the subarachnoid space into the dural sinuses, into the cardiovascular system. So lateral ventricles connect via the interventricular form into the third ventricle, via the aqueduct of the midbrain to the fourth ventricle, via the two lateral or median apertures to the subarachnoid space, eventually having the fluid return via the arachnoid villi into the dural venous sinuses, and then being carried by the bloodstream to continue this cycle. The blood-brain barrier, however, is between the astrocyte, a specific uh, central nervous system neuroglial cell, and the blood capillaries found in most of the brain tissue. The astrocytes send out processes that wrap around the blood capillaries and help to restrict the movements of materials into the brain. Uh, hydrocephalus is a disorder where there's a dramatic increase in cerebral spinal fluid pressure around the brain caused by some sort of blockage to the fluid circulation. It is often relieved by draining the excess fluid into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. A cerebral, cerebral vascular accident, special name of a stroke. Stroke can be caused by hemorrhaging, aka internal bleeding within uh, the brain tissue, or it could be caused by a blockage to blood vessels caused by an emboli or blood clot 
and or by erythrosclerosis of cerebral arteries. In both cases, brain tissue damage will occur. Four main principal parts to the brain. You have the brain stem in this area, the diencephalon, sort of the middle area, the cerebellum, posterior area, and the cerebrum, making up the large superior structure. The three principal parts of the brain stem include the medulla oblongata, the most inferior part, controls some of the vital autonomic body functions like breathing, digestion, rate and force of heartbeat, and all sensory and motor tracts from the spinal cord into the spinal cord pass through the medulla oblongata. Uh, some important structural features to the medulla oblongata include the pyramids. Pyramids are these uh, posterior protrusions that form by the largest motor tracts. They cross over in the medulla oblongata. This is the decausation of the pyramids where 90% of the motor tracts cross over. So that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and so on. Uh, there are lateral bumps on either side called the olives uh, that he re help to relay impulses from proprioceptors to the cerebellum, proprioceptors relating to muscles. Uh, cardiovascular center helps to regulate rate and force of heartbeat, and the medullary rhythmicity area adjusts the basic rhythms of breathing. There are five cranial nerves that originate in the medulla oblongata, the vestibular cochlear nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve, the accessory nerve, and the hypoglossal nerves, right and left. Uh, then we have the pons. The pons is sort of the middle area here of the brain stem. It is a bridge that connects uh, the parts of the various parts of the brains, the left sides and the right sides of the cerebellum to other parts of the brain, and it also regulates some autonomic functions. It has the pontine nuclei, which connects the cerebrum with the opposite hemisphere of the cerebellum to coordinate voluntary motor output, and a pneumotaxic area and apneustic area for helping to control breathing. Four main cranial nerves originate here, the trigeminal nerve, the abducens nerve, the facial nerve, and the vestibule cochlear nerve. Then we have the midbrain. The midbrain attaches directly to the diencephalon. It coordinates movements and relays visual and auditory reflexes. Uh, regions include the cerebral peduncles. These peduncles uh, connect the midbrain to the cerebrum and involve motor and sensory tracts passing through those areas. There's the pectum. Pectum is the posterior part of the midbrain. It has four bumps, two on each side. The superior colliculi, the superior bumps, are the reflex centers for visual activities, and the inferior colliculi are the relay impulses from the ear to the thalamus, so auditory. Uh, two main cranial nerves originate here is the oculomotor nerves and the trochlear nerves. Then we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a mass of gray matter and white matter on the posterior inferior region of the brain. It has the cerebellar cortex, which is the gray matter that lies in slender parallel ridges called foli. And then the white matter, the white matter, which is deep, is called the arbor vitae, a uh, tree of life. And deeper than that are even some cerebellar nuclei. The cerebellum has two main hemispheres, the right and left hemisphere, that are connected by a structure called the vermis. The cerebellar peduncles help to attach the cerebellum to the brain stem, the inferior Cerebellar peduncle, there's sensory information into the cerebellum from the medulla oblongata. The middle cerebellar peduncle carries impulses for voluntary motor movements to the pons, and the superior cerebellar peduncle uh, has more axons extending from the midbrain and the thalamus. A function cerebellum includes controlling subconscious aspects of skeletal muscle movement, equilibrium and balance, and evaluating how movements initiated by the cerebrum are actually being being carried out. So it's saying, this is what we want to do, this is what we are actually doing, and then it makes corrections to make sure what we're actually doing is what we wanted to do. And finally, the cerebellum also helps control the skeletal muscles involved in maintaining posture. If damage to the cerebellum occurs, you could get ataxia. This is a loss of ability to coordinate muscular movements, very similar to how someone moves when they are drunk. And another way to example for testing for it is if someone is blindfolded and they have ataxia, they cannot touch their nose while blindfolded. The diencephalon. The diencephalon is an internal structure. You can only see it if you dissect the brain, preferably by a midsagonal dissection. Its two hemispheres are completely covered by the cerebellar hemispheres. Here is a view of it in an actual brain. Uh, parts of the diencephalon include the thalamus. The thalamus is the major relay station for sensory impulses, except smell or olfaction, and also a relay station for motor functions. It possesses nuclei for memory, for awareness, and for emotion, it is a very important structure. And there's the interthalamic adhesion. This structure helps connect the two hemispheres of the thalamus. Uh, there's the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus 
controls many, many involuntary body activities, and is very important for regulating homeostasis, for maintaining a stable internal environment. It's also involved in production and control of aspects of the endocrine system by the production and control of hormones. It regulates emotional and physical behavior. It helps to regulate eating and drinking, controlling thirst and hunger, controls body temperature overall, causing to rise during infection. It regulates circadian rhythms, that is the sleep, wake, day, night, cycles of humans, also is involved in the various states of consciousness, awareness, being fully awake, uh, daydreaming, being uh, only vaguely conscious of what's going on, being asleep versus being completely unconscious, those sort of consciousnesses. The epithalamus is a small little structure of the diencephalon that ends in the pineal gland. Epithalamus is, uh, includes the pineal glands and the habenular nuclei, which are involved in olfaction. And that is it for the uh, lecture.